Video games are big business, and like with any industry, it isn't short of its fair share of boneheaded companies. While the medium itself is full of incredibly talented developers, writers, animators, voice actors, and so many other professionals that I can't list off, I'm so sorry, it's sadly the case that their hard work can come undone thanks to an ignorant or even greedy parent company. Determined to cut corners, cash in, and make their already vast profit margins even wider. This has become particularly evident over the last two console generations, and especially over the last half decade. All too often, genuinely great games are let down by incompetent publishers, and it can mean studios get left high and dry with no support. Surprises are ruined by marketing, studios get chopped and changed without notice, and at the end of it all, Metacritic averages drop, some devs lose their bonuses, and fans turn away. So, in the spirit of being that dog surrounded by flames and saying in one unified voice, this is fine, I'm Ewan, this is what culture gaming, and here are 10 times publishers sabotage their own video games. Number 10. Spoiling Jedi Fallen Order's big ending reveal, EA. To be clear, I won't be spoiling Fallen Order here, so fret not if you haven't played the game. I love you all too much to ruin that title. Anyway, when EA released Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order this November, it seemed as though the publisher had finally turned a corner. Both of EA's previous Star Wars releases were met with controversy upon their respective release dates, with the first Star Wars Battlefront reboot being criticised for a lack of content at launch, and the sequel earning equal derision for a microtransaction-heavy progression system. Thankfully, developers DICE were able to revive Battlefront 2 after revamping the progression system altogether, but the EA Star Wars brand was still tarnished. The single-player focused Jedi Fallen Order was meant to change that, and it seemingly had done, until the other week. Respawn masterminded a compelling, story-driven Star Wars effort without any of the nonsense we've come to associate with EA's recent releases, but it seemed as though EA itself was relatively nonplussed. Critics noted at E3 how weird it was that the demos shown to the public didn't match up with the great ones shown behind closed doors. And in the build-up to the game's release, it was also noted how there didn't seem to be that much of a marketing push behind Fallen Order either. EA seemingly sprung to life on that front the other week, but in the worst way possible. A Black Friday ad coordinated between Xbox and the publisher Ashley ruins the final mission's big reveal, and according to Kotaku, Respawn's devs are less than pleased, to say nothing of those players who have haven't finished the game either. Number 9. Forcing Microtransactions into Shadow of War Warner Brothers 2014's Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor was a pleasant surprise for Lord of the Rings fans. The title, headed up by Monolith Productions, was a competent and enjoyable action game elevated by something the studio called the Nemesis System, a unique gameplay element that generated unique enemies to make each individual player's experience different to everyone else's. It was a fun game, and so naturally WB decided that a sequel should be made. Great, fans thought. The first title was enjoyable, but it was clear that there was so much more Monolith could do with the license, including improvements to boss battles and a more intricate version of the factional conflict that was in the first game. Sadly, the story of the sequel proved to be anything but a fairy tale, and not in a good Tolkienish kind of way either. Sexy Shelob notwithstanding, it seems as though pretty much every bad decision that contributed to Shadow of War's controversial launch came from WB. WB themselves. Microtransactions blighted the entire game from start to finish, with many even claiming that the sequel was effectively pay to win. Number 8. Releasing Titanfall 2 in between 2017's biggest shooters, EA. Jumping to another respawn-helmed game this time, and perhaps the most underrated effort of the current console generation. Titanfall 2 did what all great sequels do and innovated in all the right areas, delivering a single-player story to go alongside respawn's compelling multiplayer. It was bigger, bolder, and much better, but while the game garnered near-universal acclaim from critics, the burst generated from its launch wasn't enough to unsettle the two other titans of the FPS genre, Call of Duty and Battlefield. We're not talking months apart here either. The game literally released about a week after Battlefield and only a week before Infinite Warfare. Sales were reportedly underwhelming, and EA only had itself to blame. Number 7. Everything about Battlefront 2's launch, EA uh, funny how EA keep coming up, isn't it? But, but anyway, as mentioned previously, the first Star Wars Battlefront didn't manage to evade controversy. Although praised for its gameplay and graphical detail, DICE's reboot boasted a complete dearth of content at launch, exacerbated by and undoubtedly linked to the fact that additional content was locked behind a $50 season pass. Still, the game weathered the storm, and DICE seemed to learn their lessons for the sequel. It included a single-player story set between Episodes 6 and 7, long-demanded Clone Wars content, space battles, and a class system to boot. 
Unfortunately, it also featured a debilitating progression system that revolved almost entirely around random loot box drops, which could, of course, be purchased with real-life currency. The backlash to the system became one of the biggest to hit the industry in years, and it meant that Battlefront 2, an obviously brilliant game microtransactions aside, took years to hit its stride. DICE's sequel has now mounted one of the all-time great video game comebacks, but to those who aren't a part of the Battlefront community, that launch day controversy is impossible to ignore. Please do go give it another shot if you can, though. Battlefront 2 is great, and doesn't deserve to be remembered for a launch day controversy of EA's making. Number 6. Cutting Black Ops 4's Campaign, Activision It's been clear for a long time that not everyone who buys Call of Duty ends up playing the single player. For the most part, players are there to hop online and shoot at or with each other in PvP and PvE game modes. But even with Treyarch's COD games boasting a particular focus on the latter in Zombies, it seemed a wild suggestion in 2018 that they would ever cut the campaign altogether. And yet, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Leaks that came out just before Black Ops 4's official reveal claimed that the studio hadn't been able to put together a single-player campaign over fears the game wouldn't meet its August release date. The studio later repudiated those reports just after the game's official announcement, stating that they quote, never started with the idea that a traditional campaign would be a part of the final launch. But here's the thing, even in that conversation with Polygon, Treyarch head Dan Bunting qualified his comments by speaking at length regarding Call of Duty's player base, with the implication being that the studio had to prioritize those areas of the game because that's where most of the attention is. Even so, why should they have to prioritize at all? There's no getting away from the fact that studios don't get a say in when the next COD releases. Delays are non-existent when it comes to that particular franchise, and it doesn't seem disingenuous to assume that the campaign was sacrificed in order for Black Ops 4 to meet its release date. Number 5. Forcing every studio to use Frostbite, EA I'm noticing a trend here, but, but hey, there's a reason why EA have been voted the worst company, like, ever, a whole bunch of times. EA's rep has flip-flopped so much over the last five years, but arguably the biggest contributor to their decade of controversies has been the company's insistence that every studio use the Frostbite engine. When used properly, and by those familiar with its intricacies, Frostbite can look phenomenal. That's fairly evident in pretty much every game helmed by DICE, who created the engine all the way back in 2008 with Battlefield Bad company. But sadly for those studios less accustomed to its quirks, using Frostbite can quickly turn into a nightmare. At the start of the decade, EA demanded that all of its studios switch to Frostbite, as pretty much every studio was utilizing their own separate engines. Problems quickly began to emerge, as Frostbite was mainly designed for FPS and multiplayer games. Bioware in particular found themselves repeatedly frustrated by the engine, with Dragon Age Inquisition supposedly a nightmare to work on, and both Mass Effect Andromeda and Anthem experiencing widespread bugs upon their respective launches. Number 4. Assassin's Creed Unity's Bugs Kill Syndicate, Ubisoft Ubisoft's annualization of Assassin's Creed had already become a problem at the start of the decade, as, while Black Flag had managed to reinvigorate the series, cracks had started to show. Everything, and I do mean everything, began to fall apart with the release of Assassin's Creed Unity, a new entry in the series set during the French Revolution. It looked genuinely great pre-release, but come launch, everything that could go wrong basically did. Unity was a buggy mess when it dropped November 2014. Characters lost faces, Jesus Christ, not that again, and players lost progress, with the launch build being near enough unplayable for most. It forced Ubi to rethink the series altogether, dropping AC's annualized release schedule and prompting a big change in gameplay for its eventual return. Sadly, one game was lost as a result of Ubisoft's annualization policy. Assassin's Creed Syndicate released a year after the previous game, and with annualized releases going straight out of fashion, not many gave it the time of day, which is a huge shame, given it actually turned out to be one of the best surprises of the current gen. Number 3. The Mafia series gets overshadowed by Rockstar, Take-Two Interactive After near enough two decades on store shelves, it's probably fair to say that the Mafia series is underrated. Initially developed by 2K Czech before being passed to Hangar 13, Mafia has long had to deal with being the nearly game. That is to say that it's always been overshadowed by two of its parent company's biggest titles, Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption, both developed by Rockstar. Mafia 2 was by no means as good as Red Dead, but it released just a couple of months after that game and, as any other open world crime title set in the past, it invariably suffered, just as its predecessor did when it released in the wake of Grand Theft Auto 3. Pitting two similar games against each other seems like something straight out of the EA playbook, but even still it appears as though Take 2, and by extension 2K, are finding new ways to mess with Mafia. Hangar 13 has been chopped and changed since the promising release of Mafia 3, and as long as things continue that way, it seems doubtful the series will ever reach its full potential. 
Number 2. The sequel to Fall of Cybertron becomes a movie tie-in, Activision. While fans today have a wide selection of genuinely great licensed video games to choose from, that wasn't the case at the start of the decade. Movie tie-ins were still the norm and franchises like Transformers had only ever seen a couple of decent efforts. That's why it was such a pleasant shock when the developers of High Moon Studios turned in such a great Transformers game in 2010's War for Cybertron, a title that divested from the Michael Bay movies and added as an official prequel to the original 80s cartoon. It was a competent third-person shooter, but the most important thing about it was that it was clear the game was made by actual Transformers fans. It also had a great story, which was improved upon in a sequel that released in 2012 and ended with a cliffhanger with the Autobots and Decepticons finally head to Earth. It even included the Dinobots and a new cover of Stan Bush's The Touch. It was great. Annoyingly, fans would never get to see High Moon's third game. Activision, in true Activision fashion, booted the studio off the next title and replaced them with Edge of Reality, who released a movie tie-in for Age of Extinction, the latest Bay movie, instead of the three pool fans were expecting. Needless to say, the title didn't resonate, and Activision then decided to waste High Moon's talents assisting development on Call of Duty. I can't stand no more. Number 1. Creating the Ubisoft Formula Ubisoft it's a real shame what's become of Ubisoft over the last console generation. The Tom Clancy brand just isn't what it was, with only one Splinter Cell title releasing over the last nine years, while all their other games have melted into one uniform open world template. Things just aren't what they used to be. Yes, UB has found success. Rainbow Six Siege may not be like the older Rainbow titles, but it's probably the most compelling multiplayer shooter of the last five years. Likewise, Assassin's Creed has also been revitalized by shifting the franchise from the action-adventure genre to something more akin to an RPG. They're not for everyone, and perhaps not even for those who enjoyed both those series' older titles, but they are their own thing. The same cannot be said of most other Ubisoft titles. Ghost Recon is now just a bland Division clone with nothing unique to offer. Games like Watch Dogs, Far Cry The Division, and Ghost Recon all typify the formula the publisher has inflicted on most of its offerings, in that they're all open world, feature similar mechanics, and all are hit with the same bugs and criticisms year in, year out. All these games are just the same thing repackaged, designed to cash in on whatever trends are generating the most cash at a given moment. UB only has itself to blame. 